Obscure City is a place where you can find many unique dangers. This is where she works. Cassandra Kiltoy, Paranormal Private Eye. Now a teenage girl's father has gone missing, and Killjoy believes that the city's enigmatic protector, the Swordsman, is the key to finding him. So Killjoy must face many deadly dangers in her search for the Swordsman. Available on Amazon.com Even extraordinary cartoons can have extraordinarily bad episodes. And when that happens, you get Ineptune. Let's kick this off with one of the most notoriously bad episodes from a good show. From Batman the Animated Series, I've got Batman in my basement. Now for you to understand the absolute horridness of this episode, I have to take you back to 1990. The Warner Brothers animation team was in the midst of producing the first season of Batman the Animated Series. The first few episodes had been completed and were waiting to air and it was obvious to everyone who saw them that this show was going to be huge, but also insanely dark for a Saturday morning cartoon. Out of concern, occasionally, the team would get notes suggesting to produce lighter episodes to air in between the dark ones to help the audience decompress. However, it's important to note that most of these notes went away once the show premiered and it started to get huge ratings. I tell you this because there are two very important things that you need to understand before we jump into this. Number one, no one forced the creative team to make I've Got Batman in My Basement. In fact, Warner Brothers was very supportive and lenient with them at the time, mostly because Steven Spielberg was working with Warner Brothers Animation during this time period, producing Tiny Toons and Animania and they didn't want to embarrass or scare him away. And number two, for three quarters of the production team, Batman the Animated Series was the first show they ever ran, which makes it all the more impressive that this show is so great. But inexperience leads to simple mistakes, and in this case, that simple mistake is called I've got Batman in my basement. So what exactly went wrong here? Basically, they had a lot of episodes to produce and a very tight schedule. When I've Got Batman in My Basement was pitched, none of the producers were thrilled about it, but opted to put their faith on the writers and see if they could make it work in the script. But when the script came in, it sucked. It really really sucked. Executive producer Bruce Timm opted to put his trust in director Frank Parr, with the belief that Parr could figure out how to make the episode work during the storyboarding process. But then the storyboards came in, and they sucked. They really, really sucked. So Frank Parr had no choice but to throw out most of the storyboards and redraw them himself. Eventually, he ran out of time and had to send the episode out to be animated. And this is what we got. An overt Home Alone ripoff that sticks out like a sore thumb in one of the grittiest and darkest shows in the DC animated universe. So let's jump into this train wreck and see just how cringy it can get. Fanboys and fangirls, I've got Batman in my basement. So our episode begins with one of Eric Radomski's beautiful gothic title cards, which is ridiculously misleading as nothing this scary or cool happens in this episode. Everything starts pretty normal for this show, late night in Gotham City, where we find a couple of cat burglars named Jay and Raven who are stealing a Fabergé egg. But they quickly learn that in Gotham City, crime doesn't pay. Yeah, all it took was five minutes, and that'll get you five years. Ooh. So this is it. Batman is about to present these two goons with an all-expense-paid trip to Stonegate and a complimentary ass-kicking. Nope. At that exact moment, Batman gets attacked by a giant vulture. <laughs> Mondays, am I right? The vulture gives Jay and Raven enough cover to get away with the egg. But how will Batman defeat this vicious bird of prey? He flips the bird off the building with a judo throw. Otomo e Nage throw for those of you who are nitpicky. And I'm not going to lie, that was pretty awesome. <coughs> Batman gets up just in time to see that all the criminals flew the coop. Some literally. But Batman stumbles upon a handy dandy clue. Birdseed. Jinkies. And now, 
after five whole minutes of waiting do we finally cut to the real heroes of this episode. Wannabe detective Sherman Grant and his partner, Roberta. Just Roberta. We find our heroes immersed in the very exciting activity of unboxing a junior detective kit. <laughs> Thrilling. The kit comes with a notepad, magnifying glass, binoculars, stereotypical 90s bullies. Come on, Frank, those are mine. That's right. Meet Frank and Nick, our friendly neighborhood douchebags for this episode. Fun fact, legendary producer Alan Burnett named Nick after his own son. He named one of the bullies after his own child. Not cool, Dad. Not cool. Bully number one spots the giant vulture through the binoculars. A hawk! Caca! But master detective Sherman Grant sets his ass straight. Hey, that's no hawk. It's obviously a giant South American vulture. <laughs> a vulture in Gotham City? Yup. Murder clowns, bat mutants, and shape-shifting mud men, totally normal. A vulture? That's just crazy! Sherman and Roberta follow the vulture because a vulture in Gotham City is a mystery worth checking out. And he's a detective. A detective, I tell ya. Our heroes follow the vulture to an abandoned birdseed packing plant. Jinkies. There, they find the two goons that stole the Fabergé egg, Jay and Raven, who are currently waiting for their boss, who turns out to be... The Penguin. Fun fact, this is the Penguin's first appearance in the show. This is the episode where they chose to introduce one of the most important Batman villains of all time. This one. This one! Further plot twist. The Vulture, whose name is Scrap, which is what they should have done with this episode, is the Penguin's trained pet. And apparently the Penguin can... speak Vulture? Wait, stop. Back it up. Now play it again, but with the Universal Translator. Excellent work, my fine feathered fiend. Tonight to celebrate you will bring me a large pizza with extra anchovies. Bro, you know they deliver, right? I mean... Our goons present the feathery felon with the egg, which Master Detective Sherman Grant correctly identifies as the Von Ulster Fabergé egg. Have I mentioned that he's a detective? A detective, I tell ya. Scrap spots the kids because, you know, Sherman has been mansplaining aloud this whole time. Luckily, Batman shows up at the nick of time, nets the vulture, takes the egg, and traps the bad guys under a ton of birdseed. Case closed. Wait, no, no, sorry, Sherman nearly gets himself and Roberta killed by turning on a conveyor belt by turning it off? What the? Batman is forced to divert and save the kids. He expediently gets them out of the building, only to get a face full of the penguin's toxic poo gas for his troubles. Do you think we've said poo gas enough? But still manages to run for the Batmobile, but passes out before he can get to safety. But thankfully, Master Detective Sherman Grant and his girl Friday are there to save the day. But there's just one little itty bitty little problem. Sherman doesn't know how to start a car. He can correctly identify a rare species of vulture and a valuable one of a kind artifact, but he doesn't know how to start a car. But if you think that's idiotic, wait until you see how criminal genius, the penguin, tries to break into the Batmobile by pounding on the roof. By pounding on the roof. Could somebody please do something smart? Thank you, Roberta. The kids get away by the skin of their teeth with Batman and the egg in tow. And now, at the halfway point of the episode, does it finally live up to its title? And Sherman gets Batman in his basement. Finally. In his delirium, Batman asks for a capsule from his visor. But Master Detective Sherman Grant doesn't get it. I wonder what that meant. Roberta, again, seems to be the only one with common sense and goes to call the police. But Sherman stops her because of client confidentiality? Because, you know, Sherman is 100% a legit detective who works out of his mother's basement and Batman totally hired him while he was unconscious. Capsule. 
Meanwhile, Scrap searches for the kids from the sky, while Penguin and his boys follow from the ground below. The felonious fowl reassures his men that it's only a matter of time before they find the kids and the egg. And for once, they don't have to worry about Batman getting in the way. The gas will keep him null and void for a good week. Which is far more sporting than using a lethal gas that will kill him instantaneously. Decorum, gentlemen. Decorum. Meanwhile, back at the titular location of this episode, Sherman's mom goes to check on the kids, which means that the jig is up if she was actually a good parent. Mrs. Grant just stands in the doorway to the basement and shouts down at the kids. Just go down the stairs, lady. It's 20 steps away. Just head down and get visual confirmation that everything is okay in your house. You're not trying to make gunpowder again, are you? What? I'm sorry. What I meant to say was... What? Then Roberta flat out tells her exactly what's going on, and Sherman's mom thinks it's a joke. That's good. Just don't make a mess. And then she leaves to go to the store, leaving her son, who apparently likes to make gunpowder, and her neighbor's kid unattended. Ugh, Sherman's mom, you suck, lady. Meanwhile, outside, the bullies are playing catch with... A brick? Anyway, they discover the Batmobile under Sherman's super secret hiding place, aka a big pile of cardboard. Sherman approaches them to dissuade them from messing with the vehicle. And this is when one of the bullies discovers that the capsules that Batman was talking about are in the visor of the Batmobile. Jinkies! Sherman immediately takes the antitoxin capsules, which Batman should totally keep in his utility belt, and just shoves one down Batman's throat. <coughs> Nah, they're rapid to solve capsules. Batman thinks of everything. However, the bullies are now aware of the situation and go to unmask Batman. Which gives wimpy ass Sherman Grant the strength of 10 tigers. No! Unfortunately, Scrap spotted them while they were outside screwing around. So now, the Penguin and his goons are at their doorstep. Roberta again goes to call for help, but this time, the bad guys have cut the phone line. And this is when Sherman chooses violence. Let's kick some dicks. So our little hatchlings go Kevin McAllister on their asses. Ineffective. The Penguin somehow makes it past Sherman's brilliant defenses, and by brilliant defenses, I mean he locked the basement door. <laughs> Thus, the belligerent bird takes the kids hostage, gets the egg, and goes to kill Batman. With an umbrella saw. <laughs> but unfortunately for him, three minutes before the credits roll, Batman remembers that this is his show. Wait, 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 wait. Batman is wearing his utility belt? Didn't Sherman take it earlier? Ugh, who cares? Take this and that and one of these. You want some too? Oh, I got something for you, son. Bat flip, motherfucker! I kid you not. When I was a kid, I thought this maneuver was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And I reenacted it over and over and over again with my action figures. It's one of those things that is so ridiculous and dumb and improbable that it circles back around to being awesome. <laughs> that is it. I am done playing games with you pointy-eared prodigious per Donkey Kick! <laughs> and so the Penguin is dealt the most humiliating defeat of his criminal career. And now, and only now, does Sherman's mom come home and find out what has actually been happening in her house. Say, Batman, you wouldn't be single, would you? I've got Batman in my basement, was filmed in front of a miserable studio audience. And so our episode ends, with Sherman running his own junior detective agency from the basement, with Roberta and the bullies as his employees. And Batman hangs out outside the basement window for reasons? And these characters that dominated 15 minutes of a full episode were never seen again. Thank God. This episode is awful. Series co-creator Bruce Timm said, 
I can't even watch the episode. It's the epitome of what we don't want to do with Batman. Strangely enough, kids like it. And on the subject of the horrid storyboards that were turned into director Frank Barr, Tim commented, the storyboard artist didn't care, and it shows. While his words ring true, and I don't feel comfortable recommending this episode, I will admit that it is entertaining. And the characters, while lame, are not annoying. And while it might not be the most ideal introductory episode for the Penguin, it is by no means the worst introduction to the character. Paul Williams is an absolute delight as the avian outlaw, and the biggest highlight of the episode. I especially love the moment when he first enters Sherman's house and pretentiously takes the time to criticize the decor. These commoners have such cheap furniture. <laughs> I don't care who you are, that's just funny. So yeah, when I rewatch the show, I don't skip this one. But I don't blame you if you do. However, believe it or not, this episode was adapted into a children's storybook that featured an expanded version of the story that includes the Joker and Catwoman. And while I might be among the few who tolerates this episode, I do not care to see the expanded director's cut. That I'll definitely skip. Until next time. Backflip, motherfucker! <laughs> Next time on Ineptoons. Hey, cool it! This is Logan, my right-hand troll. He may look disgusting, but his heart is brave and true. <laughs>